So the Lord's Supper, that's a place that we find in, towards the end of the service. It's surrounded by a bit of fanfare. The pastor says some things, we say some things back. We go up there, we eat the bread, we drink the wine, and we sit down. Uh, to someone who's new to the Lord's Supper, it looks like a pretty strange thing. So to start off, we'll answer a couple of questions about it. Why do we even do it? What is it? What good does it do? And how should I do it? To start off, well, why do we do it? Well, the answer goes to uh, the words of institution. When we recount uh, how Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he says, this do in remembrance of me. Well, that answers it right there. Because Jesus said so, so we do it. But let's take a step back and look at a little bit more of what is it. Well, the first thing is, is that it's a sacrament. Uh, we talked a little bit about that word sacrament, how a sacrament is a mystery, and it's a way that we get God's grace. But primarily, the Lord's Supper is just that. It's a meal, and that's no mistake. Uh, in pretty much every culture in the world, there's some sort of ritual that surrounds meals. Meals are a vulnerable time, a time where you spend uh, in close proximity with other people. So it's no mistake that this is one of the ways Jesus comes near to us, is through the vulnerability and the intimacy of a shared meal. Now, what is it more so than just any ordinary meal? Well, one thing is uh, all Christians agree that there's something different about this meal. There's something special going on here. And what we teach is that uh, the bread and the wine are Jesus, his body and his blood. Not only does Jesus feed us in this meal, he feeds us himself. That's something we call real presence. And that might seem a little bit strange, so we'll take some time to pick that apart. Uh, Real presence indicates that Jesus, under the bread and the wine, is actually present in a real mysterious way. Now, how is that something we can believe? Well, first thing, Jesus said so. He said, take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. At first glance, plain sense of the words, we would say, oh, well, is means is, doesn't it? Now, you might be thinking, now, there are other places in the Bible where Jesus says a statement and he means something else. Take, for example... I am the vine, you were the branches. Now, Jesus isn't claiming to be a real physical vine. He's saying, no, we're connected. Remain in me and I in you and you'll be fruitful. But this is a completely different instance. In I am the vine, we believe when Jesus says I am, he is saying that he is something. It's the word vine we take figuratively. But in this instance, the word that people are questioning is this is. And when we look at what's happening in the Lord's Supper, this isn't so much a parable teaching moment. This is a real meal in a very somber time. Remember, he's about to be crucified. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room or time for strange cryptic sayings. This is Jesus plainly saying, this is my body. And in this case, we take Jesus at his word. Now, it might seem strange that uh, this is a way that God conveys mercy to us in physical means, but this is really in character. For God. God uses created things. God uses incarnate things to deliver messages, to deliver good things to his people. Take, for example, Jesus, who is God in the flesh. Uh, that word incarnation means to take on flesh, real physical things, as a, way of convening, as a way of convening love to his people. Think of it this way. Um, the difference between the words, I love you, and giving somebody a hug. It's a real physical thing attached to to that emotion, attached to that promise that were conveyed in the Lord's Supper. God likes to use ordinary earthly things. Take, for example, baptism. When God says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. But he gives us that additional means of water that physically washes us, and then in a real way washes us clean of sins. This is the same thing going on here. It's those words, for you, for the forgiveness of sins, attached to something physical that we can touch taste, and see, we can smell it, it affects all of our senses. Now, how is this possible? Well, Jesus is God and man. Uh, how can Jesus be present at the table and in the bread and the wine? Well, we see that the risen Christ isn't bound to the laws of nature. We have that account that when Jesus rose from the dead, he walked through a locked door to see his disciples. He's not bound by the ordinary laws of nature. So it's not too big a stretch to say that, yeah, Jesus can be present in all places, in all times, even in the bread and the wine. But at the end of the day, sacrament does mean mystery. 
We can speak to what we know. We can say, Jesus said, this is my body. How is that possible? Well, Jesus is God. But how does it really work? I don't know, but I trust it. We trust that promise that Jesus makes good on his word. If Jesus says it's true, it's true. And it's almost, we want to back away from the strict logic of it. Because then you're really missing the point. Uh, that the sacrament sort of stands as its own language. It's God's action. God's doing something beyond us. God doing something incomprehensible for our good. So this is a real tangible meal in which Jesus comes to us physically. But what does it do for us? What good does it do? Well, we look to those words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, to show us that, yeah, in the Lord's Supper, we get forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, given through those means, uh, given through those words, attached to that physical thing. And people say, well, aren't I, weren't I already forgiven? I'm a baptized person, washed clean of sin. Yes, absolutely, if you're baptized, you're forgiven. What about confession and absolution in the service, where the pastor gets up there and, uh, by Christ's authority, announces to you that your sins are forgiven? That counts too. Uh, this doesn't uh, get in the way of baptism or in the words of forgiveness. This is just another way that that forgiveness is conveyed in that real physical way. The same way the words I love you count. And a hug counts too. It's just another way of conveying that same love. Now, how do we do it? Well, first thing, you show up on Sunday to do it. But there's a little bit more to it. Uh, the early church was practicing this. Uh, before the Bible was even written, uh, before we had gotten all of our ducks in a row, people were doing this. Because the people who knew Jesus, the people who saw him, remember that command, this do, do this when you guys get together. So they did. And Paul wrote a couple of warnings to people, because people were getting it a little bit goofed up. People were going up there just willy-nilly, having big feasts, eating an entire loaf of bread, and drinking the entire jug of wine and getting drunk. He said, guys, you're missing the point. You're coming into into the presence of Jesus. You're physically taking Jesus in. Have a little bit more respect. Understand what's happening. This really and truly is the physical manifestation of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. Have a little humility. And for us today, it's much the same. As we approach the presence of Jesus, we have a little bit of humility. This is a serious thing we're doing. And another thing, when you come in God's presence, you've got to be aware of who you are and of who God is. God is terrifying, mysterious, all-powerful, all-loving, and you're a sinner. So part of discerning the body and blood of Christ means recognizing who He is. And that, yeah, we're sinners and come before Him with repentant hearts. And there's a few ways we do that. We confess our sins beforehand, making us aware of who we are and letting God know that, yes, we do know we're sinners. We know what's about to happen here. And trust. Trust in those words. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And trusting that promise. And then with the help of the Holy Spirit, intending to reshape our lives, that we're coming here getting this forgiveness, getting this special touch point with Jesus, this pipeline of grace that puts us in the story. We want to come out of this changed. So as you approach the table next time, consider that. When you're walking away from the table, fed with Christ's body and blood, how is my life going to look different because of what God has done for me in this meal? And then finally, it's important to remember that these sacraments, there's a lot going on, and you can really get in your own head about it. And we can argue with other Christians about what this means, what this is, but at the end of the day, this is all about Jesus. We can get to a point with these sacraments where they become points of controversy, where they become something we get absolutely in our own head about. But at the end of the day, we hang our head on, Jesus made promises about what these things are doing, and it's a great gift. So while we come penitent, while we come uh, full of wonder, we also come forward just realizing what a great gift it is that Jesus comes to us in these special ways, that we receive Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit, in these mysterious, wonderful ways. And in these ways, our eyes are always fixed on His mercy and the love that we get from Him through these gifts.